Thank you. Um, thank you. I'll actually leave the floor to Ajaita to introduce Frontier Markets before we get into the uh, cross project findings from our study um, so that everyone is familiar with what um, Ajaita does uh, when she's going to provide context for the different insights of the study. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Right, let me put it in full screen. Um, all right, uh, over to you, Ajaita. Let me know when you want to share. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks a lot, Deborah and Lucy, for inviting me for this. Um, I'm actually equally excited to hear about the insights that are coming from this report and hopefully provide some relevant uh, feedback. So, just very quickly, I just thought it would be good to kind of give the context of what we at Frontier Markets have been doing. Um, so, we are a company that started in 2011. Uh, we've gone through our own journey on truly trying to understand why we should or should not have women's sales force and what would that even look like and how does that actually serve um, our purpose as a business, which from day one has been about connecting rural customers to high quality products and services that are very uh, focused on sustainable development goals. So whether that's clean energy or whether that's agri or healthcare services, et cetera, we believe that the right way to serve the rural customer is by truly getting a chance to understand their challenges and then investing in a supply chain um, that allows you to deliver those services at scale. Where our journey when it comes to why we've been successful and what we've done is that we really found that to truly help solve A, an understanding of who the rural customer is and how do you really build a relationship with them? And B, what is it that you would want to be able to um, build or develop to be able to actually serve your market? Um, it was two things, uh, invest in rural women and invest in a technology platform that en enables them to actually do their work best. So today Frontier Markets um, operates in a geography that is absolutely last mile rural village, uh, rural um, India. We work in village sizes that are populations between like 100 to 200 households all the way going up to 10,000. We work with rural women, that's who we invest in. We've created a technology platform and we've been essentially working with them to help us uh, create solutions or drive delivery of solutions on the ground. Uh, next slide. The way that we operate um, is we essentially what we call it is a digital platform where we've said that rural women are where they live in the villages that they operate in. They are their biggest asset is that they are social influencers. They have access to communities, they have trust and they have the uh, and they're hungry and eager to earn income. So when we select women, we uh, train them in sales, marketing, data collection, and technology. These women are working in the villages that they actually live in. So they have access to their 50 households that they know really well. And they're basically using our technology platform to collect a lot of data, profiling our rural customers and helping showcasing solutions on the actual digital platform itself. All of that data gets then curated into our technology system, which allows us to then curate solutions. So we're very demand oriented and data centric, which means that we don't just bring any product or any service onto our platform. It's very much based on our deep understanding of who the rural customer is and what their challenges are. And we believe women are critical for this. Uh, next slide. This is then supported through a supply chain. So imagine a Saheli that's living in a village. Uh, she has about 50 households. She's using technology to showcase solutions. She's also answering questions. She's also collecting their information. That rural customer places an order. And then what we have are these branches and physical delivery guys that are then getting that information, curating those products and actually delivering it to where the rural customer lives. So it's a supply chain. It's rural women at the center of really generating demand, building relationships with customers. And then it's all on technology. Uh, next slide. And it's proved to work quite well. Um, we are a team. Uh, I personally come from a microfinance background, but we have essentially collectively 100 years of obsessed experience over rural India, really trying to understand how to um, understand what the needs of the rural households are and actually build operations. We are in two states of, of the country today. We're in about 4,000 plus villages. We have a million customers that are alive on our platform. And we have now about 15,000 women entrepreneurs. That were, it changed because every month we're adding 1,000 new women entrepreneurs on our platform monthly. So those numbers will keep changing. But today it's 15,000 rural women. Um, they've helped um, a million rural customers get over 10 million products and services that they're actually adopting and using on their platform. But what's exciting is that when you combine women 
data, technology, and a platform to reach rural customers, you're actually doing a bunch of different services. So everything from marketing to um, supply chain management to getting customer insights that is allowing you to become an asset to other brands. So last slide which has allowed us to then go grow and evolve over the last like five years. So what's been really interesting is that when you are looking at crisis, as Deborah mentioned, like chaos, women are fantastic at helping you understand what's happening on the ground. And so what we've seen is our women have been able to help us really collect data on the ground to help us launch other verticals. So today we work in digital financial services, essential services, we were critical in responding to COVID, we are in the agri space, bringing inputs and appliances, um, durable smartphones, um, as well as clean energy solutions. And what we've seen is we've been able to really drive a very strong imprint of these different verticals based on one single woman entrepreneur, because her job is to basically be a gambit of holistic services using data to become a connector. So she really has become like the brand, the service provider that helps rural households at scale. So um, that was the context of where we're coming in from. So I'm looking forward to being able to then bring that perspective uh, from the India context as we see presents. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Ajayta. <clears throat> so over to the results from our study, uh, as you might see from the logo on the right, this was a study sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, as part of work we've been doing with them over the past four years, um, set, helping set up commercialization strategy for beneficial products. Um, this study started based on one um, thing we basically kept hearing that, you know, um, having a woman sales force is actually really sometimes seen as a panacea between something that can enable access to health related and more generally beneficial products on the right that can promote behavior change and raise awareness at the bottom, and that can also be an empowering tool financial for financial empowerment for female sales force. So really bringing them um, income and with the theory that this can then actually uh, enhance their lives overall. Um, but um, we also found that there was not so, so much data about it. So we basically set up on this journey to try to understand what um, current successful large-scale women sales force uh, throughout the world could teach us on whether they actually were managing to get impact better than men, whether uh, both on their customers and on themselves, um, how much they were earning from this. Um, so we looked at uh, 21 uh, projects. There are 14 that are represented on this map, which we specifically interviewed and, and really deep dived on um, as part of this work, including frontier markets in, in India, as you can see. Um, and then the others were projects we had looked at previously that we uh, leveraged the data from um, to make sure we had a more comprehensive benchmark on some of the figures you're going to see um, in the next few slides. Uh, the selection criteria were that they should operate in developing countries, reaching low income consumers, have at least 75% of women as part of their sales force, as sell health related products in the broad sense of the term, so that could include clean cook stoves. Um, to an extent or uh, other products, and it should be at least part of their portfolio, but not necessarily all their portfolio. And we only looked at projects that had, or, or companies that had over 100 women agents. Um, so the first thing we found is that actually they are, there is very little data on what is the real impact of these women. There are a lot of assumptions, but very little proof uh, of their impact. Uh, in terms of impact on customers, which is the graph on the left, We've seen that the NGOs in our sample um, were actually measuring their impact on consumers annually. Um, we had like 36% of our uh, sample of, of the 14 organizations we deep dived in that had some sort of measurement for their annual reports, uh, through annual reports on their beneficiaries. Um, we had some of the businesses in our sample measuring consumption frequency sometimes <laughs> uh, because this is obviously something very difficult to measure over time as a proxy for impact when you're selling health products or nutrition products, uh, often because donors have asked them to do so. And the majority of um, businesses in the sample were not measuring any impact on consumers. So these businesses had designed nutritious products or healthy products. They were like selling it the way they could, but they were not actually checking the impact this had on the consumers um, they worked with. Um, on the right, then we looked at whether there was data on um, the impact that these organizations were having on their sales agents, women sales agents themselves. 
And we did that by asking the company's management <clears throat> whether they uh, thought that their sales agents were benefiting in any way from these jobs. And then we, we asked them whether they actually had the data to back it up. And so as you can see, the uh, uh, deeper, darker blue there, which is the impact mentioned, has systematically been higher than what was actually measured. So a lot of this, it's not, I'm not saying people were lying, um, but it often came from anecdotal evidence and with no real uh, large scale study done to kind of verify these assumptions. The one thing that these companies were able to prove, and, and yet not all of them, was the increased income of the sales force compared to, to previously. Obviously, every one of these organizations knows how much they pay their sales agents, but they don't actually always know how much they earned before. So the increased income is not necessarily proven. And then all the other softer aspects of life improvement or empowerment, like improved skills, improved agency, et cetera, uh, people said this is something that our sales agents experience, but most of the time they didn't have the data to prove it. So we, we decided to focus mostly on what was proven and to really use um, sales and income data as a proxy to try to understand better when and how women could be best placed to sell products. Um, and we're not going to let you uh, fall asleep, even though this is still breakfast time officially. Um, so we're going to be uh, asking you a few questions through polls um, to um, check your assumptions as well on this uh, segment. So first question, when is it relevant <clears throat> to build a women's sales force uh, for health related products? I will put a caveat that these are a bit tweak, sorry, trick questions. So don't feel offended if you don't get the solution. Uh, we'll go through them afterwards as well. So first question, to overcome the mobility barriers that women face in many developing countries, organizations working with large scale, predominantly women's sales force, and here one of the three things that follows is false, and you have to find which one, so which is false. So do these organizations visit prospective sales women's households to ensure their family is supportive of them working away from home? Do they help overcoming women's mobility barrier by providing support to travel? Um, or do they overcome women's mobility barriers by proposing very local jobs? Uh, please uh, go ahead and, and vote. <clears throat> which, which of these ones is false, is the question. Uh, we have about half of you who have answered. We have answers that keep coming. Give it a think, which one is false? Which one is not true? Interesting. Uh, we might end it here uh, for the sake of time. Um, so I don't know, can you see, sorry, I'm, can you see the screen now? Can you see the answers? Yeah, we can. Yeah, great. So it's interesting because actually the one that we've seen least happening is the second one, which is the one you said was probably most true, as you, there are only three people who voted for it as the one that's not true. The reason for it is um, because basically, if you're looking to have a uh, women's sales force in a place where mobility for women is, is hard, um, this is actually very expensive and very complicated to set up to try to overcome that mobility barrier by providing support to all your sales force. First, it's expensive. And two, that might not solve the problem if the issue is really cultural and, and it, that's not gonna take away her household core responsibilities, that means she has to stay close to home, et cetera. So actually the two things that we've seen these organizations do most in places where mobility is an issue is visit the prospective saleswoman households and overcome uh, women's mobility barriers um, so that they are able to um, earn, so that they're able to, um, uh, by very sorry through very local jobs, so they're able to uh, move around uh, just in their neighborhood, as Ajayta was explaining for her Sahelis. I am sorry, I'm I am stuck on the wrong screen, which is why I'm staggering a bit. Um, how can I go back? Okay, I'm back. All right, so uh, a few examples from that, uh, from the different case studies, um, and rather the, the the learning we took from this is that a first condition for a woman's sales force to be better placed than men to sell products, whether health related or not. That might seem basic, but it's not so simple. It's basically that you need to make sure that you're not asking them to do things that are just not, or that will be really 
complicated, not so much because it's going to be complex for them, but it's going to be very complex for you as an organization to change the culture, um, at least very rapidly, if your goal is to have some sort of financial sustainability. Um, so the first precondition is that women must be able to travel, which is an, uh, must be able to sell and to do the job, which is unlikely if intercity traveling is required. A few examples of this from organizations that are very women focused. So Frontier Markets, um, which Ajaita mentioned, um, I mean, do you want to talk about this, how you had to lower yeah, your- Yeah, I mean, I was just going to give, I mean, uh, I think what you just said about the mobility piece is bang on. I actually think that all of us as organizations, we do tend to think that the larger barrier that's, 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 that's preventing women from being involved in these jobs is first, family approval. Is she allowed to work or not? And I think so. And, and then the second for me was, of course, that- um, can she locally be situated because of the mobility challenge? Um, what has been interesting for us is that we've been pushed back a lot, right, by people in the ecosystem saying, why are all of your delivery men, why are all of your delivery teams and marketing teams all men, and your women are the sales agents that are locally situated? The answer to that really was this mobility challenge, right? A lot of our women are not able to travel to multiple villages, if you're gonna be cost effective in building a supply chain, you need someone on a motorcycle that is willing to travel 30 to 60 to 100 kilometers a day. Um, and that too, working 10 hours a day, right? And so those barriers make it very challenging for it to be effective to have women be those delivery solutions. However, what we did know was that what women are very good at is that they're very good at maintaining where they live um, and actually building a relationship with the ecosystem there. So there's there's like a doorstep logistics piece there, um, which I think that they're brilliant at, but it's addressing the barrier piece, which is that they cannot travel too far. Yeah, thanks Ajaita. Uh, and similarly for Green Star, uh, which also really focuses on women in particular through family for family planning, um, their uh, local community health workers are women, but their sales agents, same story, uh, had to be men, like going to pharmacies and traveling uh, broader distances for the same reason. And one last example, uh, Unilever's project Shakti, which many of you might know, uh, which has tens of thousands of women um, uh, entrepreneurs in India. They also hired local women to sell in their villages. And at some point they introduced bikes. So that idea of the additional um, mobility solution. And it turned out that actually uh, it's mostly men in their family who ended up using the bike to go distribute the products to uh, neighboring villages, which at the end of the day, they institutionalized as the Shakti men um, who, who basically also sell products, but they're men. Um, so mobility is really a barrier to take into consideration. Um, so as a result, and this is the little matrix we'll be filling in throughout this presentation, uh, when we look at whether women um, uh, can be best placed to sell different types of health-related products, we've classified them on the right, uh, sorry, on the vertical axis um, between high unit value products, so durable products, beauty products, feminine, some feminine hygiene products, or lower unit values, which will be most FMCG products. And then on the uh, axis at the bottom, whether the opportunities to sell are local in rural areas, local in urban areas, or mobile or require mobility intercities. Obviously, the catchment area and the number of clients you can reach increases as you go. So the income you're able to make or the sales you're able to make increases as you move to the right on this axis and as you move up through this axis. And the first uh, point here is that if you are selling products that require intercity travel, um, you are likely to find that women are unable or unwilling, mostly, to take on these jobs. It doesn't mean you can't have any women, but you are likely to have sales force which are majoritarily men, um, and you typically have only 0 to 20% of women in those um, sales forces. Um, so moving on to our next question, if my computer, sorry, doesn't freeze. There we go. Um, so. Um, can we maybe launch the second poll? So hiring women for a local, now we're going to talk about efficiency. The principle is the same. You have to choose which of these statements is not true. Um, so hiring women for local sales of health-related products is often more cost-effective than hiring men because, so which one is false is the question. Women are more trusted than men and hence will manage to sell more. 
or trusted women can be easier to identify um, thanks to existing social infrastructures around women groups, making women's sales networks less expensive to build, or women are more likely to find local part-time jobs attractive than men, um, given their constraints, making lower salaries competitive to attract and retain them. So which of these three is not correct? It is, they, they are tricky. Yeah? Very interesting to see the split. <clears throat> All right, we'll let you answer. We have nearly everyone. All right, five, four, three, <laughs> two, one. All right, we are gonna end the poll. Um, so um, actually on this one, most of you got it right. The one that is not true, or at least that is not proven, is the first one. Women, um, there is no proof that women are more trusted than men, as we're going to see. It actually really depends about what. Um, what is true, however, um, is that trust in women can be easier to identify if there are existing networks, um, typically that group women together, like self-help groups, um, and that women tend to um, find these kind of positions, local, uh, part-time, more attractive than men would who have other opportunities to go to the cities or to find um, employment where the mobility is not so much of a barrier. Um, so a few examples from that. Um, <clears throat> so a, a couple of examples from pre-existing women networks that make easing recruitment, uh, that is recruitment. So frontier markets, um, I think Ajayta, you've explained that uh, a bit with the uh, going through basically the uh, self-help group to identify Sahelis. Um, and we also have Bell. Uh, you might be familiar with this program from uh, the group Bell. They set up direct sales agents uh, to sell laughing cows and other products in uh, different countries. And they often advertise like the women, the impact on women in particular in Vietnam, which was one of the first countries they decided to work with. But actually, they haven't at all made working with women a condition for these programs. What they do is they just look at who are the street vendors there that they can leverage. If they're men, very good. If they're women, very good, which has actually led them to have, uh, in spite of initially working with women and having this focus, then as they move to other countries, they really decided to work with whoever was there as street vendors, uh, which led to different percentage of women in uh, their networks in each country. Um, the other point on women's uh, preference for these part-time and local jobs, which make it more attractive to them and hence make them easier to recruit. Um, in uh, Living Goods has found that, uh, uh, I mean, initially, again, they went in with the idea that they would create um, community health workers, mostly as women, with that idea that women typically are the ones who tend to do these care jobs. But actually, they found that after a while, when the position is better known, they have men applying for these positions, and they thought, why not, after all? Um, but there is that point that initially, these local part-time, not much paid positions actually attract more women. And then men might want to come in if they see the, like, the status or they actually are really interested in the care aspect of things as well. Um, and so they now have 95% of women in Uganda and 74% in Kenya, which is uh, um, yeah, which shows that this can actually be done by both types of uh, both men and female uh, workers. Uh, and finally, just a quick quote from Jita's CEO in Bangladesh, who manages also a, a network of women sales agents um, in rural areas, um, who basically said, you cannot expect these women to be full time. They have at least five other responsibilities, including household and farm tasks. Um, Ajayta, do you want to add anything on this one? Yeah, so I'll just quickly clarify uh, two things. So one is um, 7.1 million SAGs, just so everyone knows, uh, represents 80 million women. So it's a massive network of, of, of women that you can recruit from, which is an infrastructure that is very similar to Africa SACOs. Um, and, and there are collectives now across, thanks to microfinance and other financial inclusion systems that are actually quite powerful when you're thinking about where group dynamics do work. So sure, they are existing infrastructure does make it a lot easier to then do bulk recruitment in that way. However, I think the point that we see, even especially as you're thinking about 
who do you bring in to sell what is very critical. So for example, um, even with Frontier Markets, a lot of our women entrepreneurs work hand in hand with their husbands. When especially we're talking about selling like larger appliances or consumer durables or things during like wedding seasons. So big can I can I cut you because just because this is going to be the next topic and oh, I, okay. I, I don't so want to just say that like the common but 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 just saying that like it's cost efficient to do that recruitment but it's not necessarily the st only strategy that there are dual approaches when you're thinking about Salesforce yeah so just wanted to make sure we clarify I, that. I don't yeah. want to give the answers of the next poll because oh, sorry. we'll have a chance to <laughs> okay, get it wrong fair enough. Um, yeah. <laughs> no issues <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, so going back to our little matrix then, uh, now looking at the more local aspect of things. So typically for local jobs, uh, which can be for low unit value product at the bottom here, um, community health workers jobs, or which can be agents uh, for higher value products in rural areas, agents selling multiple products on catalog or through the system that allow to sell a wide range of products like Frontier Market does. Women are likely to be more efficient from a company perspective or organization perspective because they will be likely cheaper to attract and retain over time with the better fit to their job description. Um, same thing in urban, uh, where they might be more efficient there, uh, and I mean, overall in that whole category, if pre existing women's network exists. Uh, in local urban, the mobility issue is not as big. Uh, to get a, a relatively big area where to work. Um, so there actually, uh, you, we found that you can really find Salesforce um, that can go from all women to all men for nutritious and health products. So there is not a clear rule. It really depends on, given the local landscape, is there a network I can piggyback on? If there are men, then I might want to work with men. If there are women, then with women. Um, so third questions, um, and we'll see at data how much people have uh, already heard what you meant. Um, so on the on the poll, um, again, uh, which one of these is false? One of these um, is not proven. Uh, women are better than men at selling to women, uh, or for products related to children, parents trust women more than men as sales agents, or a combination of men and women sales agents can achieve higher penetration of contraceptive products than pure women sales force. Which of these is not true? <clears throat> All right, we have about half of you who have voted a bit more already. All right, so last chance to vote. Five, which one is not true? Five, four, three, two, one. And um, you can, sorry, oh, you can see the results or not? Oh. We might be clicking at the same time, Deborah. I'll let you do it, sorry. Um, so most of you uh, actually have listened well to Ajaita. Uh, the sentence, women are better than men at selling to women is not always true. It depends what you're selling and whether there is indeed a trust factor that makes sense for women to trust a woman more than a man. But for some other products, it might actually be men who they will trust more to sell them something. Um, so if we look at specific examples, um, women are not more effective than men in general. Um, a couple of examples from Living Goods who have both these women and um, men sales agents or community health workers. In terms of the performance of what they achieve in terms of impact, in terms of sales of medicines, et cetera, it's really the same. The only place where there is a little difference is on contraception, where women manage to sell a slightly bit more than men contraceptive products in terms of contraceptive products. But that doesn't mean that women are necessarily better at selling contraception than men, because in some culture, you might actually need the men's approval. It's more of a family decision. So actually, Green Star, uh, which is really focused on family planning in Pakistan, has found that they needed to recruit men healthcare workers to really increase their penetration of contraceptives because the woman was not able, uh, had to make that decision with her husband and could not make it alone. So in their case, having men and women health workers working together to convince a family to take on a family planning um, solution worked better and really increased their penetration um, in the areas they were working with. 
Um, so um, another one, though, so when are women actually better placed is when uh, these products, the products they sell really relate to women's responsibilities, which can be what we've seen in any case is that there are three categories that can fall into this. Products related to taboos, uh, for example, Mina Mahila Foundation, which is an organization that sells um, menstrual hygiene products, has found that um, uh, women actually feel very uncomfortable buying these products outside the home or, or to a man in general. So having women door-to-door -door sales force to do this, all women, actually works very well because women are much more comfortable talking about uh, their periods with other women than with men. Uh, the second types of products where women seem to work to do a bit better um, is products targeting children. Nitri Zaza um, is a social business in Madagascar that sell infant porridge in uh, very urban areas through the animatrice, the ladies you can see here. Um, and they actually started to have men also doing this work, in particular in more remote areas for the mobility issue we mentioned. And they found that after a while, they sell about the same, but the growth curve, the time it takes them to get to full penetration is longer for men than for women because they need longer to gain the trust that the products they bring to children is actually healthy. Um, and finally, generic products targeting women can be sometimes better sold by women like beauty products. And you might know Natura, which is a a bit like Avon, a network of direct sales agents for beauty products. Um, they have over 2 million direct sales agents uh, in Latin America, 90% of which are women. It's not 100%, which I found very interesting. So there are men who are also very good at selling beauty products to women. So it's, it, you know, we shouldn't say all women, um, only women can do this, but there is definitely a tendency for women are probably more attractive to these jobs and women find it more natural to speak about beauty products with other women as well. Um, all right, so what does that mean? And now our little matrix is complete. You might see that what we've added here is the taboo woman children product in the middle where women are indeed likely to be more effective as long as you're in a local setting, whether urban or rural. Uh, and in this uh, category, as well as in the community health workers, both categories in green here, uh, we typically find 80 to 100 percent of sales agents or community health workers who are women and not uh, and not men. Ajaita, do you want to comment on this piece? Uh, no, uh, I mean, so the only thing that I, I would say is that um, um, I think the what's been interesting uh, for our experience has been that when you are actually um, segmenting your product basket according to truly understanding who is influencing what decision. So what's interesting is there's been always a misnomer that because men have the money, therefore they are the only ones that are a part of decision-making. So depending on the product category itself, you're absolutely right. There are very distinct categories where women are taking the sole decisions on, on purchases. And that is actually where there is a direct connection between women, sales force and networks. And I think the network effect piece is a really important one. I mean, as we're talking about like the SAG networks, um, you know, women, if you're selling the right kind of feminine related products, you can actually take data and get larger customers faster. Like, cause there is that um, uh, viral effect, right? In terms of women networks, which I think is very important to see that um, added value. But then the second piece is that um, if you do do a deeper dive on segmentation and you understand where women will be influencers, but men will make the purchase decision, and then you find the combination between the two, you do see that um, uh, the uh, adoption or the conversion likelihood is higher. So, um, so I, I think I think the learning for us really is is like, um, and I think this is true for a lot of the companies that you're you're presenting, as we're all spending a lot more time. Um, creating our own political power analysis of households and truly understanding, you know, who influences, who pays, who takes decisions, and based on that, who is the right person to communicate um, on both the purchase purchase decision side, but also on the uh, selling side. And I think that's the combination that actually ends up becoming a really short win. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Thank you for that. Um, so now, uh, in terms of income, they expect to earn. Um, so uh, 
fourth poll, we have five here. Um, so uh, one before last. Um, again, which one of these do you think is not true? Uh, when it comes to women's agent income, women agents usually earn less in rural areas than in urban areas. Successful women sales forces manage to pay their agents up to $4,000 per year in full-time equivalent. We've put things in full-time equivalent, meaning if a woman works part-time, you multiply her income by two to see how much that gives uh, as a full-time equivalent so that we can compare depending on how many hours each of these networks uh, ask their women agents to work. Um, so, or selling a diversified basket of health-related FMCGs enables even rural agents to earn up to $2,000 a year in full-time equivalent. Which of these do you think is not true? Again, um, waiting a bit more for more answers to come in. All right, we have about half of you, so we'll count to five, five. Four, three, two, one. Um, all right. So this one is the winner of my polls because you got it wrong. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit sadistic on these ones. Um, but so basically, um, actually, uh, women agents do earn less in rural areas than in urban areas just because the number of customers they can reach out to is typically much less. Um, and successful women sales forces can actually reach $4,000 a year of sales for full-time uh, um, organizations, uh, full-time employees or entrepreneurs. The one that's not true is that if you just focus on health-related FMCG, so if you don't have, that was probably the trick of this last bottom question, if you don't have any durable goods to sell, the margins that are relatively small on these products and the fact that you don't reach a lot of people in rural areas mean there's no way you can manage to pay your sales agents $2,000 a year, even if they're performing very well. Um, so uh, the, now let's look at the numbers. Um, um, so in this chart, we basically have each of the 17 organizations where we had data on how many, um, how much income their sales agents were making. Uh, per agent in full-time equivalent on the left and the actual annual income, the real amount they were making. So if that bar, for example, for organization two is lower, it's because their sales agents were working on the part-time. Um, if the bars are the same, like for the organization one, it's because these agents were working full-time. So full-time equivalent is the same as how much they actually earn. So we'll look at income by, by our little categories that you might remember from the matrix. Those on the bottom left, selling health-related FMCGs and medicine in rural areas um, are um, providing, uh, are, are earning, as you can see, less than um, $1,000. So clearly less than $2,000 even for best performers, um, which was the, that last uh, uh, question on the poll. Um, so yeah, they, they're not getting to $2,000 per year. Um, if we look at the next category, <clears throat> so durable goods in rural areas, we had a smaller samples given that these are less immediately related to health. Uh, but you can see that actually you can get to pretty good income thanks to the larger margin you have on durable goods. The trick for these networks is really to find a way to not over complexify their supply chain and their whole processes while adding new products. Um, and so, I mean, I think Frontier Markets is a, <laughs> a very good example of this. And Ajaita, I hope you wouldn't mind if I say that you're the top one uh, on this chart. Um, so uh, indeed, it is. it can be quite lucrative um, for women to do these jobs. Do you want to say a word on this, Ajaita? Yeah, I was just going to because I was just responding to someone on the chat group. Sorry, I'm trying to do a listen and also respond so I can be active. But um, um, yeah, I want to be. I want to be clear, right? For us, I think as a company, what we've learned is that um, you know, women as women are influencers, and I think it's a really important thing to understand that like women are influencing decision making, which is psychologically related. So, like in our product basket today, to be clear, we sell like TVs, refrigerators, washing machines, kitchen appliances, um, home lighting systems, clean cook stoves, to solar lights, to smartphones, 
et cetera, et cetera. And of course, also healthcare services, um, FMCG, sanitary napkins, et cetera. So I don't want us to leave this conversation with an assumption that men are better at selling higher value goods and women are better at selling fast moving goods. Cause that's not true at all, oh. right? Um, yeah. um, women are influencing decisions. So in our situation, you know, Sahelis are able to collect data on who is getting married, when is someone actually, you know, wanting to give someone something in terms of aspiration? Diwali, for example, is like a really big season time when people do make high purchase decisions or even helping in facilitating finance, right? Because women are good at helping get KYCs, right? Know your customer and fill that guarantee of who's going to get a loan. So they were actively involved in the durable goods sales process, which is why today our women, when they're earning the kind of money that they are, it is a combination of high value goods that might not necessarily, I mean, to be clear, these are rural families. So they'll make a purchase decision of a high durable good once in a year. They're not gonna buy it several times in the month, but to know that nugget of when is this rural family ready to buy this product and what kind of loan do they need is, it's, it's gold. Um, and then being able to respond to that because she has trust and she has influence. But then the second piece is that when you think about this on an FMCG side, it is the relationship, which is then more about the repeat business, right? So the example that we normally give is um, our work with cattle feed or our work with sanitary napkins. Cattle feed, you know that a rural customer that needs to buy cattle feed for their um, cow will need it every month. So she's able to build that consistency of repeat business. Sanitary napkins, it's a subscription model where they know the adolescent girls or women that need the sanitary napkin will buy it every single month. So I just wanna make sure we're understanding that uh, clearly. So we're not coming in because I'm seeing the chat on the side and I'm worried that we're thinking that men are good at selling high good, high yeah. levels and women are not. I just um, wanna get, get back to this. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you for bringing that up because I'm not seeing the chat. Um, so yeah. just to clarify, as you can see the top part of this graph except for the mobility one if you're selling mo mo like if you need to be mobile but that's true both for high unit value and low unit value products you're not going to have many women right uh, but if you're looking at the um, high unit value like the golden and the and the blue actually in terms of how many women or men will you find in these set networks when they're successful it's from zero to a hundred percent so it can be fully women it can be fully men it can be a mix of both there is no like except when you're talking about these taboo products or products that specifically uh, for the reason we saw earlier target women, uh, the women can be as effective. Uh, some women are gonna be better. Some men are gonna be better. They're, it's not a gender game, um, basically. Completely agree with that, thank you. Um, so we were um, still in rural areas. So let's move to urban areas. So in urban areas, we only looked at companies that were uh, selling purely health-related products, so either nutritious or um, health-related, I mean, health products. Um, and what you can see there is that you can have um, for sales age, sales networks that are really well managed, uh, sales forces that do earn up to four thousand dollars a year, um, in as as because they work full time and because they're like make made highly effective with plan groups and other strategies that basically help make Salesforce more effective. If you're interested in that, we have another report specifically on direct sales forces in urban areas that I can share the link with, uh, about afterwards. Um, but so anyway, I guess what matters here is to say in urban areas, kind of nearly automatically, they will earn more because the catchment area is bigger. And if you manage this sales force well, you can really get these women to a relatively high um, income as well, even with FMCG products. Um, so last poll. Um, how do we recruit and train these agents, when women agents, um, to make sure they're as effective as possible? Um, so which of these statements is false? The observed characteristics of most women sales agents, the, the ones that are retained and stay and prove to be high performers, uh, include, um, and so which one of these is false, again, is the question. Huh? So which of these criteria is not actually a good criteria? that uh, she must be established and recognized in her community. She must be young and unmarried with lesser household responsibilities. Um, so she doesn't, so she have less of that mobility issue. Um, she uh, has to re have received support from her family um, and she needs to be a confident speaker with previous working experience. So letting you answer. <clears throat> So 
So we're at half, so I'll do countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. We can look at the results. Um, so um, you got this one right, well done. Um, indeed, the criteria that none of the organizations we looked at had was young and unmarried with lesser household responsibilities. Because actually, um, in, ma in many cases, uh, on health products, there are some of the health products that are related to women, so that um, so that trust aspect is important. So typically, a woman who is established and recognized in her community, probably a bit older, um, will work better. And more importantly, uh, in some places, having your young and unmarried daughter going door to door to see all households in an area is not going to be something a family will want to, to see happening. Um, so actually, uh, most of the time, the best performers are some that have uh, basically are in their 30s to 50s, are married, have children, but children are old enough to stay without supervision for long enough for that woman to do her job as a sales um, agent. Um, it's not at all the profile of the younger, you know, 18 to 24 um, or 18 to 30 women without children or with, obviously not with young children. Um, so um, if we move on then to a few examples here, um, and I'll try to go quickly on this one so we have a bit of time for questions as well. Sorry, oops, these are the last two slides. Um, so the, um, the, in terms of like the key criteria we've seen, she has to be, women have to be recognized in their community. Um, they have to be married with children old enough for her to be away. Um, uh, an additional criteria, which actually Ajayita, I think you had insisted on and that we checked with um, the other uh, projects we looked at and is increasingly important as well, is that they are owner of a smartphone and confident to use it, especially for reporting on sales, sharing of best practices, of photos of what they did on the day, et cetera, as obviously um, phones are becoming more and more tools for um, uh, Salesforce management as well. And finally, uh, ideally, they would be confident speakers with uh, previous community experience, although this is not absolutely necessary, as a lot of these organizations provide training and capacitate uh, women on, with this last um, aspect of the job. Um, and just one very quick snippet, there are more of this um, in the report, but so a couple of best practices that can really help uh, attract and retain uh, women's, specifically women's, um, uh, Salesforce performance. Um, so uh, the first one is to uh, enable for a flexible schedule, often part-time. A um, couple of examples, living goods, um, community health workers really organize themselves as they wish. Um, Green Star agents only work in the morning so they can be with the children, with their children in the afternoon. Uh, adapted incentives targeting the family really seem for Bell, for example, who has both men and women network. Um, or for Farming Nigeria, which um, sells uh, uh, fortified yogurts in Nigeria. And they also have a men's sales force, so they're really able to compare the two. Um, they've seen that longer term incentives around medical insurance, around the family, around children's school fees really works better or really works well to retain women specifically. Uh, specific trainings targeted around that last bit of confidence, speaking in public, et cetera, is something women value a lot as well. Um, and finally, adapting the work to the, their physical capabilities. And again, as we've said in, at the beginning, on their in, uh, adapting this work to their mobility constraints. One example from Danon Kiteras, which sells um, Danon products um, in uh, low-income communities in Brazil, um, that their, their women agents uh, have a catalog to allow um, people to order products and then they deliver it themselves, but they only carry the products that have already been pre-purchased. So it's not carrying for nothing. Um, so I think that's it. Um, Ajaita, any comment on this or should we open to questions? Um, I, I'm just, you know, I was just, again, looking at the chat. So one thing I was, I was thinking that we should, it would be great for us to also address is that um, um, I know uh, the, the first slide that you had brought in, which was on the impact slide, and we had kind of talked about why most organizations are uh, capturing income generation, but not necessarily the other impact uh, metrics around what is this for? Because I, I think we mentioned a few times why it's cost effective for the company, why the company can take advantages of kind of creating conversions. But I do, I just wanted to kind of maybe close with saying that like, there's a massive impact opportunity here. I think Lucy, given the work that you and I have done with Co-Impact, we've learned 
that, you know, in India's context, for example, right, um, the labor force in, in India is not even 20% um, uh, for women and rural women, it's even less than that. So there is an economic empowerment gap that is existing quite massively if we look at this in India's context. And the reality is that the solution that you're being able to provide for rural women specifically, given the constraints that Lucy's already well, very well um, stated, is that they're not getting full-time jobs, right? They can't get employed, right? Um, because of the lack of flexible hours, the lack of mobility, et cetera, et cetera, and working in rural geographies. So entrepreneurship or like livelihoods has become like the way to make this happen, which has been interesting. And there's a direct correlation between income generation, decision-making, resource understanding and agency. Re meaning, can women earn enough income to suddenly contribute to their families in a meaningful way? Will they be positioned in a different um, uh, setup in their household to be able to be influential? And is there a status shift that happens in their communities because they're providing a value-driven service, especially if you're talking about areas like healthcare, agriculture, finance, uh, clean energy, et cetera, which is where all of us kind of sit in terms of the organizations that Lucy has presented. You know, we brought in the TV refrigerator because I just wanted to give a cheeky example, but the point was that this is a much more about um, being able to change the lives of these rural villages, but these women are becoming central to that, right? And so what we've seen as measurements, and I, and, and I think the point that Lucy is bringing up in that first slide is that the challenge that I think most social enterprises face today is that we don't necessarily have access to donor-driven capital that enables us to build a strong modern learning evaluation system that allows us to go deeper than income generation or business metrics. Um, we're not being able to spend time to do baseline assessments of what women were first, where are they today, and where are we linking this to economic empowerment? But I can tell you anecdotally, but reality, is that um, what we're seeing consistently is that if we are successfully able to find the right balance between picking the right entrepreneur, giving them the right set of products, linking them to the right um, area of where they can operate, and then link that to data and tech and ongoing support, they will earn consistent income on, an, on a predictable way, which enables their ability to actually drive more decision-making and power. And that's really where when frontier markets, when we say that our women are earning $100 to $200 a month of income relative to what they're otherwise earning, it's powerful. You'll hear anecdotes like, before this was an opportunity, I was known to be my husband's wife, you know, my father's daughter, and now all of a sudden I have my own identity. So there are definitely very systematic um, things that we're trying to capture. But for the purpose of this audience, I would say there's a lot more that can be done if we got the right tools and we got the right resources and partners actually help us track this. Because I do think the access companies that are presented today are doing some fantastic work, at least proving that women as Salesforce can be effective, it can be powerful, it can actually lead to some large impact at scale. That was like the only thing I wanted to just close up. No, I agree. I actually didn't cover the last slide in the presentation what that was pretty much saying this. So thank you, that's the perfect transition. Uh, we might have time for just a couple of questions, if anyone has a burning one. Um, there are a few in the chat, if nobody wants to speak up. We have Emil, who's raising his hand. Emil, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Lucy and Ajaita, for, uh, for the great uh, presentation. Really inspiring to see that, that journey of frontier markets uh, continuing going upwards. I got one question, uh, Jaita, in terms of the uh, sort of the adoption and usage of your digital solution for these Sahelis. I think that's, uh, uh, well, we recognize a lot of the insights shared in the, in the past hour, uh, but one of the things that we sometimes struggle with is like, how do we ensure that these uh, rural saleswomen actually start adopting and using some of these digital solutions? Can you unpack that a bit more? How did you navigate that? How did you ensure that, that usage in the best possible way? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, we designed the technology with them. That was the most important piece. Um, I think that we understand the barriers when it comes to digital divides, when it comes to women. So one, I think Lucy covered very nicely, which was program design. Can you design an, a, 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 a business opportunity that caters to some of those barriers, which you know that we've done with our Sailing Initiative, which literally ticks marks all these barriers and 
addressed it. The digital piece was around, can you create a technology? So two things, one, let's recognize rural customers in India are equally not digitally savvy, right? So you could not create a tech solution that was about having mainstream rural customers adopt an app at scale. It was not gonna happen. It's a very assisted economy, right? So we knew the women need to have the right tool. We spent time designing that tool with them. What would they wanna be doing? So localized it, made it vernacular, made it voice enabled, very uh, non-literate, to be honest. Um, and, and then we added these like AI training solutions uh, into the bot. So anyone can literally download the app and they can learn and practice how to use it on their own. Um, that was huge. And I think localization was a really big piece. The barrier that we obviously still face, but I think India is now shifting is cell phone adoption, right? Generally, right? Like we know women don't necessarily have the smartphone, even if a rural family has a smartphone. But what's exciting is in like literally the last three days, there's been like 10 announcements where there's like a, a massive effort to do a distribution of smartphones to rural women specifically um, and getting, and then, and then you ideally are using the tools that they already know. They know how to make phone calls. They know how to take photos. They know how to capture basic information. They know WhatsApp. And these are phenomenals, phenomenons that I think are very relevant. In Africa's context, I think some of my other colleagues, they're, they're even luckier, right? Because actually the digital barrier or divide is not as large because there's been digital adoption for FinTech, for, for digital payments and things like that, that have been much more robust, right? In Africa than it was in India, but that's how we've been kind of catering to that shift. Thanks, Ajayta. I think we could go on for a very long time. Uh, Deborah, over to you to conclude, unfortunately, as we are at time. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Ajayta. I think we could have gone on for at least another hour. I think it's such a impactful, actually, topic that we, I mean, if you see these companies that Lucy has presented, I think the ripple effect of the impact that these companies are having is, is, is just huge when you have that model when you're targeting women as sales forces. Um, we will be sharing um, Lucy's slides and um, also the report that um, uh, Lucy has covered today. I want to thank very much um, Ajayta and Lucy for sharing your insights and Ajayta for sharing the on the ground reality um, that you're, you're going through with um, Frontier Markets. Thank you very much for that. And I want to thank all the attendees for joining today at our Impact for Breakfast. And we look forward to having you at another Impact for Breakfast session in the coming weeks or month. Um, um, see you then. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. I just shared my email address in case because I saw there were great other questions. So happy to connect. Um, I'll be sharing your contact details and Lucy's as well in the, in the follow-up notes. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.